Welcome everyone to DCYO Presents, our weekly in-depth interview with DC Youth Orchestra program artists about what inspires them. I am Liz Shergan, your host and the executive director of DCYOP. On today's show, we are joined by DCYOP faculty member Ken Giles. Hi, Ken. Hello, glad to be here. <clears throat> Ken has curated an interesting video list for us today, and we'll also be sharing some photos. If you look closely, you may see some DCYOP students in some of these videos and photos. We really want DCYO Presents to be an interactive experience, and so we will be answering some of our viewers' questions throughout the show. If you have a question or a comment for Ken, please type it into the chat box. We also want to hear your reactions to the music you see today. <clears throat> our audience is mostly children and families, so please be kind and thoughtful. Arles, say hello, Arles. Hi, everyone. Arles is our Assistant Director of Operations, and he will be monitoring today's chat and questions. So let's get started. Mr. Giles, as you are so fondly known here at DCYOP, hmm. history with the organization, which we will explore today. Tell us, when did you first get involved in DCYOP? I first came to DC Youth Orchestra in uh, 1986 when I came with my older son, Jonathan, who was in the beginner violin level A class. And uh, I really sat with all the parents um, around the room as the kids learned how to hold the instrument and how to play. And uh, very early in the experience, I, I was so inspired by how good this was for my son and how, how all the kids were engaged and responding that I, um, I really decided almost at that moment that I wanted to do this myself. I wanted to be a, a violin teacher and a music teacher and uh, help kids learn how to play. So I, I kind of date my music teaching from that early DC Youth Orchestra ex experience with my son. And we actually have some photos of your son in the DC Youth Orchestra mm. we'd like to share today. So Evan, can you bring up those photos? And Ken, will you talk us through what we're seeing? Well, this uh, photograph uh, from 1988 uh, is uh, two years after Jonathan joined the program. And uh, Jonathan's in the second row on the far left in a blue shirt. But these are the kids uh, who started out as violinists. And um, some of these students went on to spend 10 or 12 years at DC Youth Orchestra, uh, like my son, who spent 10 years, and rose up to the top, top orchestra. Um, some of the violin teachers are standing in the back, but it's an interesting uh, early snapshot of kids from the 1980s. We have, I think, two more photos to share. Here's uh, my son Jonathan when he was uh, the concertmaster of the Intermediate Orchestra shaking hands with Lynn McLean. Uh, Lynn McLean, of course, was the founder of the DC Youth Orchestra program and for many, many years conducted several of the ensembles. And um, Jonathan had the privilege of sitting first chair violin for a while and shook hands with Lynn McLean at the end of the concert. Wow. And then here's uh, the top orchestra, uh, 1995. And my son Jonathan is in the second violins in the second stand wearing a bow tie. And uh, this was all at Coolidge High School. Uh, the program started out at Coolidge back in 1960 and stayed at Coolidge until the, uh, I don't remember the exact year when we moved down to Eastern High School, but. Uh, Coolidge was the home for decades. By the way, there's a one person in the second stand of the first violins who is Camille Lewis, and Camille was uh, a teacher, violin teacher at DC Youth Orchestra for a while. She's now a music teacher at Banneker High School here in DC. That's pretty amazing. We have a question from the audience which asks us, where was that tour? Where did they go on tour? Well, the orchestra has taken many tours over the years. Um, the I, I don't 
my son did not go on tour. So I, I think the point of t labeling it as the tour orchestra was this is the highest level orchestra and when a tour happens, this, these are the kids who go on tour. Um, that particular year, I don't believe they did a tour. Got it. <clears throat> Before you became a full-time music teacher, you worked for the U.S. government for many years. Throughout this time, you still played music. Where did your love for music begin? Well, it really goes back to uh, my home. Uh, my parents were both musicians. My mom played string bass. My father played trombone. Um, for a while, all of us played in the community orchestra in our town in Illinois. and. Uh, I went to the National Music Camp at Interlock in Michigan in 1963 and 64 and 65 and then I went to the Interlock and Arts Academy which was the year-round school and finally graduated there in 67. So I spent several years in the uh, early and mid 60s at Interlock in Michigan and I just did a tremendous amount of music there uh, because uh, one of the things the orchestra did at Interlock and then was they played a concert every week and uh, you would get your music on Monday morning and rehearse every day through Saturday and then on Sunday play the play the concert and we played all the Beethoven symphonies and most of the classical repertoire uh, during the years I was there I probably learned more music at Interlock and than most people learn in you know music conservatories so it was a, a remarkable experience. That, that's, that sounds fantastic and I'm so excited because you actually kept some of the photos of when you were in both the camp and the uh, academy. So Evan, can you show us that and, and can, can you walk us through what we're about to see? So um, my first year or summer at National Music Camp was um, 1963. Here's, here's our group. And we're all wearing the camp uniform, the blue corduroys and the white shirts or the blue shirts. Um, white shirts on Sundays, blue shirts the rest of the time. And uh, some of my cabin mates uh, have gone on to illustrious music careers. Uh, one of them is a professor at uh, Yale. Another was the first chair horn in the Dallas Symphony. And, um, and I met over the years at Interlock, and I met some wonderful young musicians who did go on to be uh, first-class performers around the country. Um, in the in the 1960s, Interlochen was really a, a magnet for young musicians who wanted to work really hard on their music. Here's the Interlochen Arts Academy Orchestra from 1964. So that was, I think, the third year, second or third year of the school, and. Um, the orchestra was large and uh, uh, played a concert every week, every every Sunday night. That's 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 pretty that's pretty amazing. And in fact, we have a video that we're going to show, which I understand is a tradition that happens every summer at Interlock. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, we're going to show uh, uh, Franz Liszt's Les Preludes, and this is the traditional last concert piece. For the summer, uh, National Music Camp was founded in 1928, 1928, and every summer on the very last concert they conclude with this lay prelude, and it's a chance for just about everybody in the camp who can play the piece to get on stage, play together. Uh, so there's, I think maybe 300 kids in this orchestra we're going to watch, and then the dancers get to dance down the aisles and up on the roof of the uh, performance uh, building, and you'll see that in the video. This video, I think, is from uh, 2019, last summer, um, and I played in a couple of these concerts in the 1960s, and frankly, they are very, my memories of it are very similar to what we're gonna watch in the video. Well, then let's watch.
That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's very memorable. Yeah, in fact, we have a comment that from Pam, who may or may not be my mother, that says, I remember those days, participated, and it was in the audience. Yeah. Says that because I too uh, went to Interlochen when I was a high schooler, and it was, it was very formative for me. It really helped pr propel me in the direction that I I have I am today. And one of the amazing things is that you had that experience as a camper and as a, a student at the academy, but you've also taught students who have gone there and had that same exact experience, correct? Right. There are some uh, DC Youth Orchestra students who in just the past couple of summers have spent uh, time at the arts camp. And I think a couple of members of the Youth Philharmonic are scheduled to go this summer, assuming everything is normal this summer. <laughs> Let's hope because it's a really <clears throat> special experience. So I hope uh, for our students' sake that they have that opportunity. And my understanding is that throughout your whole, you know, musical career, you also had interests that have been outside of music. So tell us what initially brought you to Washington, D.C.? Well, uh, in addition to the passion for music, I have been very interested in social issues, government, uh, sort of uh, improving our society, civil rights, uh, peace, health and safety. And so even as a young person back in Illinois, I was interested in being involved in the government in some way, and I learned about the PAGE program, the Congressional PAGE program, and I wrote letters to the uh, senators and representatives from Illinois, where I lived, and uh, said I wanted to be involved in the PAGE program. And uh, in 1964, uh, Senator Dirksen, who was one of the Illinois senators, uh, sent me a note and sent me a letter and said he was ready to appoint me to the Capitol Page School and that I could be a Senate page. And so at the same time, I had been at Interlochen for a while, but I left Interlochen and came to Washington, D.C. And I worked in 1965, I worked as a U.S. Senate page and saw some very momentous uh, changes in our government at the time. The most significant was the voting rights law which was passed in 1965, and I saw that law get passed by the Senate, and I saw President Johnson give his speech that endorsed the voting rights law, and um, really uh, it, it was the best example I can think of of government at its best, government doing what needs to be done to make our society better, more equal and, uh, you know, better. Yeah, and I actually think we have photos of you as a Senate page. Yeah, here, here I am sitting, uh, sitting in the front row, and Senator Dirksen is in the back, and uh, one of my classmates, Tom Davis, is in the back. And Tom Davis, for those of you who are in Northern Virginia, uh, Tom Davis represented the Northern Virginia Congressional District in the U.S. Congress for several years. So... Um, there I was. I think I was 15 years old then. And here's Senator Dirksen uh, autographed a magazine to me. And uh, I think we got one more photograph maybe from the We Shall Overcome speech. This, this is from the um, Congressional Joint Session of the House and Senate when President Johnson endorsed the voting rights law. And I'm sitting in the second row from the left with several other pages. You can see the younger people sitting in the row there. And I'm, I think I'm the second, no, the third from the back in that row. Um, President Johnson gave a speech. This was at the time of the marches in Selma, Alabama, 1965 for voting rights. And uh, Johnson gave a speech to the Congress where he said, we have to overcome a lot of bigotry in this country, and we shall overcome. So here was the President of the United States using the words quoted from the anthem of the Civil Rights Movement, and it was a symbol and a signal that uh, the Voting Rights Act was going to pass. And it was a very important part of our civil rights history, and I was able to sit right there and listen to it, and then watch the Senate vote for it 
after that. Here's a photograph of all the pages in 1965. I'm in the second row, about eight or nine from the left. And uh, there were African American pages, uh, but it, we were all boys at the time. Uh, the girls came in 1970. The page system was finally opened up to girls too in 1970. You were truly in D.C. during a very critical moment in our, our history. How? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I saw the demonstrations in front of the White House. At the same time that people were demonstrating in Selma, other civil rights activists were demonstrating right in front of the White House, singing We Shall Overcome and, um, you know, carrying signs for voting rights and equal rights. And uh, I was very moved by this I, I, as a teenage page. and. Uh, it really influenced me the rest of my life, uh, made me convinced that civil rights and social activism is part of what makes America great. And my understanding is that that experience really has profoundly impacted you both as a musician and a teacher, and that you use this a lot in your teaching, correct? I do. Um, all of our social movements over the years have had music. The labor movement had labor songs. The uh, anti-slavery movement back in the 1800s had a whole series of, anti of abolitionist songs. So the civil rights movement had civil rights songs and they, uh, people sang them and the, the songs gave people a feeling of strength. Sometimes the songs documented what happened but often it was just to make people feel like they could go out there and demonstrate for civil rights. And We Shall Overcome is a good example of that. Uh, the song became the anthem of the civil rights movement here, and now, of course, it's been sung all over the world. And I have used the civil rights songs in my music teaching, uh, both at DC Youth Orchestra, where we play those songs on violin, and then when I was the music teacher at Shepherd Elementary School, the kids would sing the civil rights songs when we do concerts. And I believe we actually have a video of your students at Shepherd Elementary singing with the DC Labor Chorus, We Shall Overcome. Yeah. DCYOP students in that video? At least a dozen. Um, I, I taught violin at Shepherd in addition to general music and uh, many of the Shepherd students who played violin with me at the school signed up at DC Youth Orchestra. In fact at one point I think the level C ensemble was almost half students from Shepherd Elementary. So, I love it. 
and some of them some of them are still at DC Youth Orchestra today. Ken Giles, our greatest advocate. Before you became involved with DCYOP and made your transition as a music teacher, you worked for the US government and you still believe that good government is important. Um, and so during this time you worked for the press office of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. That's right. And, and it's because I, I do believe and I still, and you see it right now during this uh, pandemic, we need government for health and safety. We need it for safety standards. We need government for taking care of older people and disabled people. Uh, government serves so many important roles and uh, we need competent staff people, you know, efficient and effective government workers. And uh, I, uh, I think, you know, it shows right now, it shows the whole country how important good government really is. And so you, what, tell us about what you did when you worked in the government. Well, I, I was in the uh, press office, the communications office. I did press releases. I did video news releases. I did interviews. Um, I, I, I still have some recordings of interviews I did about fireworks and <laughs> carbon monoxide and poison prevention and um, so it was interesting and, and good work and important and, and it's carried on by other people in all the agencies and government. I, I do think, uh, you know, sometimes people don't realize how important it is at, at all levels, federal, state and local, to have just good, effective people working in the government. Absolutely. And while you are working for the government and as one of these good and effective people, you are also still making music with a folk band called Bright Morning Star. My understanding is that you had some pretty special collaborations. Well, this uh, carries on my social activism through music. Um, I, uh, and even though I had spent most of my younger years playing classical music, I was just, I loved uh, fiddle tunes and bluegrass and folk music. And uh, uh, I did join a band, Bright Morning Star, and we sang uh, peace songs, uh, safe energy songs, civil rights songs, songs about all kinds of social issues. And uh, we met Pete Seeger, who is, was a wonderful singer songwriter and, uh, and activist with his own music. And he liked us, he liked our music, and he agreed to travel with us and uh, do some concerts with us. And um, uh, I, I think we have a couple of songs that uh, we did, Bright Morning Star performed with Pete Seeger. Uh, Pete was a mentor to many young musicians, not just my group, but many others, because he really wanted people to carry on these songs and, and to carry on the idea of music as a way of expressing uh, your concerns about civil rights or saving the environment or, uh, you know, just about any issue. And uh, Pete had hundreds and hundreds of songs in his repertoire and he uh, taught them freely to people and, and mentored a lot of younger people like my group then. And so we have two videos. One, the first one we're going to see today is your band with Pete Seeger. And you are singing in this video. And I believe the song is If I Had a Hammer. Right. This uh, was a song Pete and Lee Hayes wrote. And it became very popular in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, thanks to Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, in this performance, we're going to sing it the way Pete originally wrote it, uh, without the ooh part. But... Uh, <laughs> but you'll, you'll see it. <clears throat> Let's see it.
pretty awesome. Yeah. And for all of our viewers, you are the one on the right of the video wearing the suspenders. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> yeah. You're a little bit more obvious because you're playing violin. So tell us about the next video we're about to see. So um, we're going to watch uh, This Land is Your Land, which is a very popular song. It was written by Woody Guthrie. Uh, Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie were friends. They traveled together. They sang together. Uh, and Pete uh, popularized the song. Pete would sing This Land is Your Land in just about every concert he did. Um, in fact, uh, I understand younger kids, like first grade kids who know this song, think it's the national anthem. It certainly is a, an unofficial anthem. Um, and when we sang it with Pete, it was really like we were just one step away from singing it with Woody Guthrie, which is pretty special. was was taken in 1983 i believe in ohio correct 
Yes, um, Pete traveled with us and did several concerts and uh, we managed to get a copy of a copy of a video made from that. That's, that's <clears throat> I'm, I'm so happy and I'm so grateful that you were able to share that with our students and our, our viewers today. Would you, so not long after that, your first son started at DCYOP and you began to make the transition into a, a, a full-time music teacher. Would you say Pete Seeger's mentorship affected you as a teacher? Absolutely. Um, I, I realized that <clears throat> music and history are intertwined, linked. Music documents history, music occasionally influences history, and uh, as a music teacher, I was always trying to draw the, the historical uh, context for whatever music we were doing. And um, Pete wanted us to, he wanted everybody, first of all, he wanted everybody to realize that anybody can sing. He would have the whole crowd singing. And, uh, and by extension, anybody could play an instrument, some kind of instrument. And, uh, and then he wanted us to remember that songs can speak up for issues that we care about. And um, so when I was a music teacher at Shepherd Elementary School, we you know, sang the songs of the Civil Rights Movement and we sang blues and jazz and learned about the history of blues and jazz. And we did some classical music and uh, learned about the composers. And um, it, it really, I think, helps students uh, appreciate the music, but also appreciate how it it's part of our society. It's not separated. It's really integral to, to what we do. We're seeing that more and more now as we make this transition to this hmm. virtual reality, how much music is a, 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 a refuge for so many people. Yeah, and uh, look at all the musicians who are posting their, their music and, and uh, you know, artwork on, on the social pl media platforms. They're, they want to sh share it. So musicians are just putting house concerts and, uh, and just everything that they can to help people feel stronger, I think. <clears throat> And one of the wonderful things that you've done as a teacher at DCYOP is you've created opportunities for students at different levels to share their music in front of larger audiences. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, I've always been uh, interested in trying to help the intermediates have a memorable experience. Uh, the, the top level orchestra goes on tour and that, that's a life memory that they'll have all their lives. So I've wanted the intermediates to have something that they can remember too. And for several years, we every other year, we went over to uh, the Mystics, uh, Washington's uh, women's basketball team, and we played the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, at the beginning of a Mystics game. Uh, here was one of our performances, and, uh, and uh, you see the woman over on the right-hand side of the photograph. She is uh, Sheila Johnson, who owns the Mystics, but she's also a violinist and a violin teacher. And uh, she played along with our kids from DC Youth Orchestra. It only took one minute to play the song, but it's, uh, it's a very memorable experience to stand there in the middle of the basketball court and play. And I think that we have the 2014 performance to share with you today. Yeah.
was from our 2014 performance. And in fact, I believe there are some students in that video that are watching today. So I'm going to just ask you to, you know, call yourself out because there's one more video that we're going to show you today. And there are definitely some students, you can see headshots of students that are still in the program today. Um, and then the last video that we're going to show before we get to that, it's, 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 it demonstrates the work that you do outside of DCYOP. And while you are a teacher at DCYOP and you teach outside of DCYOP, you, you integrate almost all aspects of your music making. So tell us, what do you do outside of Saturdays at DCYOP? Um, I go to Shepherd Elementary School and I do a group violin class there. Uh, and I think there's one student from that class who has been at DC Youth Orchestra this year uh, I go to Eaton Elementary School and do some group violin classes there, and there are two or three kids from Eaton who are at DC Youth Orchestra this year. And in the summertime, I do a lot of violin lessons and viola and guitar lessons, too. And um, at the end of the summer, for several years, we do a free public group performance at the gazebo in Tacoma Park, and uh, we play classical music, we play blues, we play jazz, we play fiddle tunes, and we end it with civil rights songs. And I think we have a recording of uh, the end song, the last song in that performance from a few years ago. So students, if you're listening, type us in the chat if you see yourself. video was shot a couple of years ago because I know some of those students have since grown about a foot yeah right and uh, and I this hasn't been this is pointed out to us that there are so many DCYOP students uh, I know that Lucy is is listening in today um, and that we also saw the Colds Atlanta Catherine Liberty there's so many DCYOP students that are in that video and you've over the years that you've been with DCYOP you've impacted um, so many young musicians and that we see them graduate our program. You, you have had the experience of both having a, a child go through the program, start at the beginning violin and graduating, but you've also had the experience of being a teacher and seeing students start with the program and graduating. Uh, there's nothing better for a teacher than seeing your students succeed. That's why people teach, uh, to try to pass it on. And um, I, I especially, it's very heartening when students sort of understand the, the context. So it's not just notes on a page or, you know, fingers on a fingerboard, but it's, it's, they're really understanding, oh, this song or this music has some relationship to our society, and it, especially in the civil rights songs, these are historic songs that um, really influenced our society for the better. Uh, when we used to sing these big concerts at Shepherd Elementary School and the kids would sing the civil rights songs, 
it was the the parents would say thanks for teaching the songs because we know they're important but it's the grandparents who came up afterwards and said i used to sing these and i'm so grateful that you have brought this into your classroom at dcyop and that years and years of students have had the opportunity to engage with music outside of just the Beethoven and the Mozart and the Brahms that we we think about when we think about youth orchestra because it really is something that broadens their perspective um, and you know to your point music is is something that connects us across so many of our differences and it's a way to express ourselves in some of the hardest of times and so now that we are in a, a very unexpected point in human history and with many of your students that are listening what is your advice as as their teacher how can they use music during this period of time to really stay connected and stay grounded well uh i suppose as a teacher it, it, it's uh obvious to say work on your craft practice, get good, play as well as you can, learn all the techniques, learn the repertoire, just work to be the best possible musician you can be. But then as a, you know, uh, taking a step back from that, uh, think about the history that the songs represent, think about what our society needs to do to get better, how can, how can you use your music to either highlight an issue or inspire people to to work for equal rights or save the environment um, and uh, it can be done with all kinds of music it, classical is is wonderful i love the classics but look at all the songs that have been written by songwriters and and uh, look at the folk music that has actually addressed some of these things in many different cultures over the years look at the um, the songs that have inspired movements like the civil rights movement and the labor movement. Um, all of that music is available and people can play their instruments and sing their songs in those areas. We have a comment that says, this is so inspirational. It gives hope to all of us out here. Thank you. So I, I echo that sentiment. Thank you so much for sharing your story you. today. Um, I know that you have incorporated this when I've observed you teach, that you often bring this into the classroom, your your own personal story into the classroom. And so it is so wonderful that on behalf of the organization, we can we can have the opportunity to chat with you and and capture this and record it. So if any of our viewers want to stay in touch with you and perhaps, you know, for all your students, they have your information, how would they do that? Well, I, I have an email uh, account and it's fine to say it. It's kengiles2 at verizon.net. And uh, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to correspond by email and uh, uh, we can possibly play together this summer, but uh, you know, I'm sure eventually we'll be back playing over at the DC Youth Orchestra, so maybe I'll see people over there. Absolutely. Uh, not far from the gazebo that we had our last video and we're at Tacoma Education Campus and you know DCYOP is taking this one stride at a time and so hopefully we'll be making music together soon in person and until then I hope that everyone will take Ken's advice and continue their craft and, and think about ways that it can connect you to things that you find important outside of music. So I just want to say thanks again to DCYOP faculty member Ken Giles for sharing your story. <clears throat> it was a pleasure to speak with you today. In the coming days, we will post this recording online on DCYOP's YouTube channel. And we will also include a link to Ken's listening list and photos for any of you who want to see this, um, all of them compiled and click on them, you'll have that opportunity. We want to know what you thought of today's show. So please take a short survey posted in the chat. It really helps us every time to know how we can make this show even better and some things to look forward to. Next week on DCYOP Presents, we will talk to DCYOP alumnus and principal conductor Ken Whitley. Learn about Maestro Whitley's experience as a cello student, what encouraged him to pursue a career in conducting, and how he found his way back to DCYOP. 
Listening to Music is on break this week in observation of Emancipation Day. It will be back the week of April 23rd, where artistic director Evan Ross Solomon will explore the music of rebellious composers. Learn about composers who made a splash with works that were ahead of their time. More information is available on our website at www.dcyop.org. And speaking of artistic director Evan Ross Solomon, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Of all of us here in DCYOP family, wish you the, the best and brightest of days. Until we meet again, everyone, thank you for joining us to, today and stay safe.